Hello, everyone, and welcome to our McLaughlin College Lunchtime Talks. We have a very special session today with uh, Professor Meta W. Spencer, who will be presenting on how to subtract removing greenhouse gases from the atmosphere. And we always begin our McLaughlin College events and activities with the virtual land acknowledgement. This meeting is virtual and because of that, we are not all actually gathered in the same space. York's land acknowledgement might not represent the territory that you are currently on. And I would ask if that is the case that you each take the responsibility to acknowledge the traditional territory that you are on and its current treaty holders. As a member of the York University community, I recognize many indigenous nations have longstanding relationships with the territories upon which York University campuses are located that precede the establishment of York University. York University acknowledges its presence on the traditional territory of many indigenous nations. The area known as Tukarondo has been caretaken by the Anishinaabek Nation, the Haudenosaunee Confederacy, the Huron Wendat, and the Metis. It is now home to many indigenous peoples. We acknowledge the current treaty holders, the Mississaugas of the Credit First Nation. This territory is subject to the Dish with One Spoon Wampum Belt Covenant, an agreement to peaceably share and care for the Great Lakes region. <clears throat> professor Meta Spencer, Professor Emeritus of Sociology at the University of Toronto, has been uh, coordinating or was coordinating a peace and conflict studies program at the um, University of Toronto on the Mississauga campus until she retired in 1997. And she served also as the president of uh, Science for Peace. And um, I met met a number of years ago um, when I uh, offered a, an article uh, uh, in Peace Magazine that she edits. She's been doing that for quite a period of time. Um, she's also noted for one of the seminal textbooks in the field of sociology the Foundations of Modern Sociology, which is in 10 editions. And um, over a million people have um, read worldwide. Um, and Med has also published uh, extensively in other areas, including the Russian Quest for Peace and Democracy. And uh, she still, as many of you who are on this call today know, very active in the peace movement. Um, and um, as well as on the environmental movement and other areas. So without any further ado, please welcome um, Meta Spencer with us today. Welcome, Meta. Thank you, James. Very generous of you to invite me. Um, I um, have been, uh, for the last four years, hosting a series of one hour long discussions by Zoom. Some of you may have seen them uh, with experts on various topics, global issues, and many of them are about global warming. So over the years, I've formed some inferences about which ones are the most realistic to be trying to promote. And I think since I believe that all uh, halfway informed citizens should be uh, thinking about what we need to put our bets on. Uh, uh, I want to share my opinions today, and they are probably pretty subjective, but I've found in, indeed that as I've talked to real scientists, which I'm not, I'm a sociologist, um, that uh, they disagree themselves and they don't necessarily know about each other's work either. So I did get an overview uh, of a number of different uh, proposals for intervening in uh, and trying to uh, make a, a change in the issues of global warming. And uh, some of them seem realistic and some of them seem uh, maybe even a little dangerous. In fact, many of them could be dangerous. There are risks involved with any of them, but we need to evaluate them and make our own judgments about which we think are the most reasonable um, uh, projects to try to fund and to promote. So I expect I'll talk about uh, 40 minutes and then I expect that there'll be a conversation if that's okay with you. Uh, so form your own uh, thoughts uh, to share at that point. Um, now, I, I don't need to persuade many of you that there is a problem, that global warming is a serious issue. Uh, at least I hope I don't have to uh, 
convinced anybody. But I will tell you that what I'm lying awake uh, uh, with uh, these days is mainly methane. Uh, because the permafrost is melting in the Arctic and the ocean uh, in the Arctic has uh, enormous amounts of methane hydrates at the bottom, which are bubbling up. And um, it, as it happens, uh, they predict that a, if you had a sudden release of 50 billion tons of uh, carbon, that would immediately, within a few months, add 0.6 degrees Celsius to the planet's temperature, and you couldn't do anything about it. Well, okay, what is uh, 50 billion tons? How much of that is, um, what a fraction of that, of what's really there? Well, they say just under the Arctic Ocean alone, they expect that there are 1,400 billion tons of carbon locked up in the hydrates down there. Number one, please, uh, if you will, Sean, we have uh, some photos and I want to show you the methane bubbles that are coming up off the bottom of the Arctic Ocean, they're real, and they come up in plumes. And as a matter of fact, NOVA, if you have access to NOVA, which they don't seem to show necessarily in Canada in, in, uh, on YouTube, but uh, NOVA has put together two recent excellent shows about um, permafrost and uh, negative emission technologies, which is really the topic of my talk today. So if you can get hold of those, they're much better than I could show you because they have the wonderful images. Number two, uh, if you will, um, uh, Sean, uh, we have, um, is there a possibility that um, uh, these things will explode, the things at the bottom of the ocean? Well, they are exploding on land. Here's a sinkhole in Siberia. They, uh, in, in the summertime, you see a sum, uh, this big hole, which is about a block, city block square. You can't tell the size, but show number three, because the win winter, you, here's a different image of, of a sinkhole in the winter. But what happens is that there's a concentration of methane under the, in the permafrost, and it, it just explodes and, and, and blows up. So it could do it in the ocean as well. And in any case, the amount of methane coming up that way is really quite scary. So we have to be worried about methane. And the reason I worry especially about it is because it's not really part of the calculations that the scientists in the IPCC have been making. They sort of think that the, the assumption was it'll be hundreds of years before we have to worry about that. But we have to worry about that right now. And indeed, we have to start removing ambient carbon starting right now. And in my opinion, we don't have any time to waste. Um, the uh, carbon in the atmosphere, it's not just a matter of, please, folks, do not add. We also have to teach people, and here's how to subtract. But the, uh, the uh, objections have been that if you tell people, yes, we could remove some of the carbon from the atmosphere that's already been put there over the last 200 years, that the uh, fossil fuel industries would say, well, then go ahead and let's put all the as much more out there as we want, uh, because we could always take it out, you know, no problem. No, it is a huge problem. And by all means, the most important task in front of us is to stop putting it out, uh, put the fossil fuel industries out of business, replace them with uh, sustainable energy, and, and not then start removing it, but start removing it now. There's no reason not to, except that, of course, we haven't done the research yet su uh, sufficient to um, to be sure of what we're doing. And so we're going to have to take some risk. I'm sorry, but it, we're at the point where I think we have to, uh, we have to, we can't be as sure as we'd like to be. Okay, I'm going to talk about number four, please, Sean. Uh, I'm going to talk about five different technologies that I just personally think are the most realistic and reasonable and uh, least likely to cause any harm. Um, number one is regenerative farming. Number two is forestry. Number three, negative carbon concrete. Number four is brightening the clouds. And number five is using iron salt aerosols to oxidize methane. And uh, the reason I choose these is I think they're the I can't 
really foresee any very likely dangers, and they could be implemented uh, realistically. We know how to do it. So I, I think these are reasonable things to get going with as soon as possible. Um, so I, I want to start off with number one, regenerative farming. Uh, now, the, bl the blessing about this is that we have to do it anyway. We are going to have to feed 9.3 billion people by the year 2050. But we're depleting the soil and we're not, uh, we're going, if anything, downhill in terms of the uh, richness of the soil. In fact, we are losing 3.4 tons of fertile soil every year for every person on the planet. This is by erosion, by the wind blowing things away or the floods washing things away. Uh, and, uh, and we are just not taking care of it. What we have to do is put carbon back in the soil and it, Whatever we do to feed the planet is also exactly what we need to do for the sake of uh, global warming to combat that. So it's a blessing. In, uh, when uh, Paris uh, uh, held the COP meetings a few years ago, the French government proposed to uh, the meeting that uh, a, a pro project called Four Per Me, that is, they want people in, around the world to increase the carbon in the soil, not by 4% each year, but only by four per thousand each year. And doing so will reduce the atmospheric concentration of carbon dioxide enough, they say, to make up for all of the world's current emissions of greenhouse gases. That would be wonderful. And, and the blessing is we need to do it anyway, just to feed the growing population. Okay, so how do we do this? Um, let's see, you can uh, take off these, uh, this list if you want, Sean, because uh, I want to talk about regenerative agriculture here for a while. And uh, what is it? Well, there are a number of techniques that need to be adopted by farmers everywhere. Number one is stop plowing. No-till agriculture. Every time you turn over the soil, you expose the carbon in it to the air and it floats away. So we want to stop doing that. We want to keep the ground, the carbon in the soil and then add to it with things like roots, growing different kinds of crops, no monoculture. You don't want the, the dirt to show. If the images that we have about um, uh, uh, farming, usually row upon row upon row of green stuff with a lot of brown space in between where the dirt is showing. You don't want the dirt to show. You want uh, to cover it with cover crops and mulch, and you want a whole diversity of different kinds of, uh, of uh, uh, plants that you're growing there. You want to use trees and legumes that fix nitrogen in the soil so that you can reduce or eliminate the use of chemical fertilizers because chemical fertilizers, there's a whole scenario there that I hate to share with you right now, but about the extinction phenomena you know, of the past. Uh, we might be on the way to doing that by uh, putting this fertilizer into the ocean, uh, but I can, don't have time to talk about it. You can look it up. Number five, if you will, Sean, um, let's say that we also need to apply compost to the soil. And here you see a, a, a machine putting it on there. That's in California. And they found that just spring, sprinkling, it looks like they're heaping it up, but the, you can just sprinkle the uh, compost on the soil and for go away for three or four years. And even three or four years later, the soil is richer and the uh, 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 plants that you're growing there are more productive than uh, they were without it. So it's worthwhile. Compost and uh, manure and uh, biochar, which is a whole lecture in itself, it's really, uh, uh, biochar is really charcoal, which uh, captures carbon and holds it for thousands of years. You can look up the word terra preta if you're interested and find out what the people in South America were doing thousands of years ago, that the carbon they put in the soil is still there. And um, so now let's go to the most uh, controversial aspect of regenerative farming, and that is grazing. Animals, you're going to, most of you or many of you are already vegetarians, I imagine, because you think that we have to stop eating meat in order to save the planet. 
Well, uh, re regenerative agriculture says otherwise, that we in fact need animals. They are part of the uh, ecology, the uh, environment, and they do, in fact, some of them, you know, the ruminants uh, emit methane through belching and so on and through their, uh, their, their manure. But uh, in fact, if you handle them correctly, uh, you can even sequester more carbon than they emit through their methane uh, uh, di digestive system. And you can even reverse desertification, which is really necessary because much of the land on the planet is drying up, either through overgrazing, bad use of, of uh, farming uh, and animal husbandry, uh, or uh, or just not enough animals. And that's why we have deserts around the world that are increasing. Number six, please, Sean. Um, and how how do we have to do, uh, how do we make, uh, take better care of animals? Well, now let's assume that this green spot is the pasture for all of these cows. Normally they would, in conventional agriculture, they're just going to be wandering around separately all over the uh, whole green uh, area, uh, eating uh, year round, uh, eating the same grass, but spread out and scattered. Now, that is exactly the problem we've got to overcome. You uh, Regenerative uh, farming puts them into separate paddocks, and it's very careful about keeping them densely clad clustered together where they stir up the soil just a little bit. They uh, eat the grass just a, a certain amount and they poop and they pee. And then you want to move them around as soon as you see that the grass is just getting the right amount of their treatment. You move them to the next quadrant of your uh, pasture with electric fences and you keep moving them every few days or you have to watch how often how the soil is doing and move them when they need it and you keep moving them around and when they get back to this first square where they were the, the there's been an opportunity for that part of the pasture to restore itself and it's much better for their having been there than uh, if they had been uh, scattered all around the whole paddock. So that's the, uh, the main uh, technique of uh, re uh, regenerative grazing. And I want to move on to my second big uh, innovation uh, or uh, I intervention anyway to prevent global warming or slow it down, and that is forestry. Okay, number two is forestry. And it used to be that we had six trillion trees on the planet. And we're now down to three. Uh, there's a, a research outfit in Zurich, Switzerland, that has done very scientific measurement for the first time. And they count that we have just a little over three trillion trees on the planet now. And that we need about 1.2, about 1 trillion more. And they say there's room for just about that. A little over 1 trillion trees could be planted uh, on, on this planet without uh, giving us any harm, in fact, doing us some good. But of course, you have to know what you're doing when you're doing forestry. You should do uh, either plant the right uh, trees or uh, and, and make, make sure that you plant the ones that are in the right place for, for doing what they need to be doing, and then you have to care for them. Because three quarters of the trees that are planted die right away, pretty soon, they are not looked after. So you have to weed them and water them for a couple of years. And um, therefore, be careful where you put them because you have to have people close enough to do the job of, of weeding and watering them. You have to, you should retain the large trees instead of cutting them down and replanting them with new ones. Uh, the reason is, yes, it, it's, it's true that small trees um, do have a higher rate of uh, uh, capturing and sequestering carbon per unit of volume. But, you know, a big tree, let's assume a big tree only is uh, capturing, let's 2% uh, per year. And a little tree is capturing, uh, a sapling is capturing, let's say 50%. I just made that up. Well, uh, nevertheless, a big tree is ca capturing more carbon just because it's bigger. And uh, that is, that's a good reason for maintaining your old growth forests rather than cutting them down and starting over again. But uh, eventually all trees uh, die and you have to uh, either let them lie there and rot, in which case 
the uh, the um, CO2 that they have contained will go back into the atmosphere, or you can capture them and use them to make buildings or durable products such as furniture. Now, one of the things they're doing nowadays is using what they call mass timber for construction of buildings, which is a good idea as long as you don't cut down trees that you have no business cutting. And uh, mass timber is you take smaller pieces of wood and you laminate them together and you can make re really big posts and piles that you can use for constructing high rise buildings. And although that scared me, the idea when I first heard about it uh, put me off because I was afraid of uh, burning uh, buildings. They say that actually those uh, piles of uh, mass timber withstand uh, fires pretty well. The outside gets charred, but the inside retains its strength as long as concrete, and that's long enough for you to get outside the building in time and escape, which is really the name of the game. Well, okay, so here we got the opportunity to make more, uh, more trees, and he says, they say that we have room for another trillion, but where are we going to put them? Number seven, Sean, they made a map showing where they, uh, we could uh, put uh, a trillion trees. Uh, and when I looked at it, it bothered me. And in fact, even they themselves acknowledged the problem, which is if you look up there, it's pretty much in the Arctic. Quite a bit of it is in the Arctic. And they acknowledge that, in fact, not all trees do have the same effect. In the boreal forest, and large parts of which are under uh, in permafrost, the uh, trees uh, actually have a warming effect rather than a cooling effect, which they do in the rest of the world. So you don't want to add forest tree in the boreal area, or certainly in the uh, permafrost area. And I would take uh, take that out of there. It's one of the big problems in the in the uh, Arctic is the permafrost is melting in part because the trees are in fact growing there because it's warm enough for them to now, and they are growing. And we don't want them there because they are melting the forest, the permafrost. And, and when they do so, the frozen uh, organic matter, old grass that was frozen 30,000 years ago, begins to decay. And um, the microbes get at it and make the methane. And that's where we're having the new methane and CO2 problem. So I would say let's take the Arctic out of the area where we want the potential for these trillion trees to be placed. And then we have the question of where are we going to put these trillion trees? Well, my solution is in urban forests. The, uh, the Crowther research people in Zurich said, don't use farmland, don't use forests that are already forested, and do not use cities. They didn't give a reason for not using cities. And in fact, I think they're wrong. We need to use we need to use cities as a place to plant more trees. And, uh, but by cities, uh, I, I want to uh, introduce you to uh, Professor Sandy Smith of the University of Toronto Forestry Department. And uh, she is a specialist on uh, urban and uh, peri-urban forestry. Uh, so number eight, if you will, uh, Sean. Uh-oh, can't play the video. Well, it's all right. Sandy is just telling you that uh, by urban, she means even some of the farmland in the periphery of cities. And, uh, and she uh, very much approves of the idea of increasing um, the number of trees that we have in cities. And the beauty is, if you look at a map, let's say, of Ontario, you will see thousands of miles of roads in the countryside. Well, the countryside roads are places where people can get. You don't want to put your plants, uh, your new trees on the top of a mountain someplace with no roads because you can't get people there to water them and, plant and uh, you know, weed them and so on. So they have to be cared for. But on a road, you can get people and they can do the work. So we, uh, if you just count the number of trees that you could plant along uh, country roads, there's a whole lot of trees, space there. And also around the edges of, uh, farmland. Each plot could uh, accept a lot. But here's the, the real trick, and nobody has paid much attention to this. Yes, my own hobby horse. I think in five years, you're going to not want a car anymore, because very soon coming up is the electric car, and they're going to be run by driverless taxis. And a driverless taxi 
is a whole lot cheaper. Each family is going to save about $5,000 a year by not owning a car because these driverless taxis are extreme, especially the electric ones, are going to be very, very cheap. And they will arrive within 30 seconds of when you call them. So you don't need a car anymore, which means you don't need a garage. You don't need a parking spot. And when you go shopping, you don't need a parking lot in front of your grocery store or the building where you're going to work. You don't need parking lots anymore. Now, this means that I am trying to lobby the city council of Toronto to say that all of the newly vacant parking spots along the streets should be required to be predominantly uh, planted plant places where we plant trees or forests, not just a few trees, but you need to plant uh, trees very densely uh, close together and they need to be indigenous types of uh, plants. Um, I would recommend you to look up something called Miyawaki Forest, M-I-Y-A-K-A, W-A-K-I, M-I-Y-A-W-A-K-I. And that's a type of forestry that uh, has very dense concentrations of trees and they love each other. You have to have a whole diverse collection of trees and you can fill even a parking spot with a whole forest of trees in the city where people are available to take care of them. And here's another recommendation, an order. I hereby order you to go dig up your lawn and replant it with trees. This is, we have no business with these stupid lawns. They are uh, polluting us and they are requiring too much water and shame on you, get rid of your lawn. I'm, I'm trying to get my condo to put in something other than uh, lawns out there, but I haven't succeeded yet. Uh, we, if all of the cities, you know, there's more in North America, more land devoted to lawns than to the most common crop, which is corn. So if we just turned our land into our lawns into many forests, we'd be way ahead. And that's really the the next project of mine. Okay, let's move past forestry into my third uh, new uh, proposal, which I think is realistic, turns out. Um, And that is carbon negative concrete. Um, About 8% of the global greenhouse gas is emitted in the process of making cement. Now, imagine that you could, for every unit of greenhouse gas that you're emitting, you're stop emitting it, but you're actually capturing that same amount and sequestering it and putting it into a a permanent uh, form that'll never get back into the, well, for thousands of years, it won't get back into the atmosphere again. You're actually, instead of... uh, uh, not just stopping adding uh, greenhouse gas, but you're actually subtracting greenhouse gas by making concrete. Well, believe it or not, that is possible. Now, it seems that what happens is that the, um, um, I'm sorry, we can't show uh, videos. Maybe we can show another one in a minute, but um, we, Uh, We can actually make concrete now that is carbon negative. It sucks carbon out of the atmosphere and locks it up out of of the way. And concrete is made of two different things. Cement, mostly Portland cement, which is where all of the energy and the greenhouse gas is done. They have to heat this stuff very, very hot to make the cement. And that uh, emits a lot of uh, carbon into the atmosphere. But the other component of concrete, about 80% or more of it is made of aggregate, which could be sand and rock and stuff. It's mostly limestone. And some people are now working to try to figure out how to make cement that isn't as, uh, doesn't produce as much greenhouse gas as it uh, conventionally does. Whether or not they make it uh, is uh, not clear, but even if they don't, you can still have carbon negative concrete because 80% of the content uh, content of the concrete is the aggregate. And you can make uh, aggregate 
out of CO2. And that's what they're doing. And there's an outfit in California called Blue Planet, and they are making carbon negative aggregates from CO2. So uh, even when you combine it with the with the cement that does put out CO2, the amount of the aggregate is so great that you, the combination is carbon negative. And they're going to be putting in, he told me, Brent Constance. Try it, Sean. See if you can put up number nine, Brent Constance. But if you couldn't do it, Sandy, you probably can't do hers either. His either. Oh, I could actually play the video. Can you? We'll play it. Okay. Good. Um, it's about roads, private land, and people, and that's what urban forestry is. And it includes cropland, farmland, agricultural. Okay, that's the one we didn't see. Now let's see Brent. No, that's Salter. Try Brent. Brent Constance is number nine. Number nine uh, wasn't sent. I believe the file didn't was go there. No. Okay. Well, too bad. Uh, he is a professor at Stanford, and he's the head of this outfit called Blue Planet, and they are making. Uh, they built the San Francisco airport, the new airport, using their carbon negative concrete. And now he said he has contracts in China for to build. I think he said sixty new plants that are going to be making concrete in China. The Chinese are ahead of us, I think. But, uh, and, uh, you know, when the uh, uh, barriers need to be put up to protect cities along coastlines, they're going to have to use stupendous amounts of concrete to keep the sea out. And this means that if, if we use carbon negative concrete, uh, we'll be way ahead and actually take the carbon out of the atmosphere and lock it up in concrete in uh, our buildings that or our uh, bridges and roads and highways and stuff. So that's uh, number three. Let's move on to my fourth proposal, which is to brighten the clouds. Now, you've probably heard of the albedo effect, or I, uh, it means that you've heard that if you painted your roofs white, it would help reflect the sun and keep things cooler than if you have black roofs or black, black roads or even trees that are dark. Uh, that's one of the reasons why trees in the uh, northern zones are, have a warming effect rather than a cooling effect because trees are dark and um, you'd rather have the show, the snow showing and reflecting the the uh, the sunlight back. Uh, well, um, the same thing happens. The main source of albedo is are the clouds that circle the planet all the time. And clouds, if they're very white, uh, reflect more than dark clouds. Um, we have large and small droplets in clouds. Uh, that is, clouds that have large droplets are, are dark. Uh, so please now show number 10, if you will, Sean. And that is uh, Professor Stephen Salter at the University of Edinburgh in his messy office. And he's holding up two jars of glass uh, balls. And you see that one of them is darker than the other. And the only reason they're darker, they have the same number of uh, balls in them, but the uh, one that's darker uh, has larger balls than the other one. So if you can get clouds to be composed mainly of tiny, tiny particles, uh, you will have white clouds and they will reflect more lights. And all you have to do is tweak them a little bit to have a stupendous uh, size effect. It's quite amazing. There's a guy named Sean Toomey who made this discovery. He was interested in clouds and he was just uh, astonished to find out how little water you need to spray into a cloud to change it to white. So in fact, they figure that cloud brightening could reduce global temperature by three degrees Celsius. And uh, it would even be feasible to, to accomplish it. You take a very fine mist of salt spray, the, the salt water evaporates and these particles, there's a little node in each particle and, and the salt then is, becomes the nucleus for a, a new droplet and you want it to be a very tiny droplet. 
They only do this over the ocean, partly because you don't want the rain to interfere with uh, or the clouds to interfere with uh, agriculture on land. But uh, over the ocean, uh, it, especially the wonderful pl place with, to do it would be in the Arctic. Because in the Arctic, believe it or not, there's more sunshine in the summer uh, than there is in the equator. And uh, that's because, of course, it's uh, daylight, uh, year, uh, 24 hours a day in, in the Arctic. Um, and you could put up, uh, according to Salter, uh, you can take him down now. He's getting tired holding those jars up. Um, you can, uh, he says you could put 800 little ships uh, up there in the Arctic, each with a machine that's about the size of a fridge, uh, spraying uh, salt water. And for about $5 billion a year, we could uh, offset and uh, re uh, turn the climate back to pre-industrial levels. Uh, so they're working on that. Put up number 11, which will show you where they're going to be doing some work uh, in the uh, Great Barrier Reef. You see these beautiful corals. Well, they say they're all dying. Now put up number 12, who is Professor Daniel Harrison, somebody that I interviewed. He is a professor at Southern Cross University in Australia. And he is in charge of a project to save the Great Barrier Reef. And the way he's doing it, if you put up number 13, you'll see his uh, ship, which is uh, a, a, um, a ship where they're going to, you see that stuff coming out the back end, that spray, that's uh, their effort to put nanoparticles of salt water into the atmosphere. It looks like it's going down, but actually they say it floats up into the stratosphere or into the clouds anyway. And, and the idea is that by putting the clouds over the Great Barrier Reef whiter, you're going to keep the water underneath cooler and it's the heat that's killing the corals. So that's what they're trying to do. Um, the problem is the nozzle. And I think that uh, if you have uh, number 14, the nozzle, um, you'll see that uh, they are, all kinds of people are working to try to, to get a perfect nozzle that will spray the tiniest particles of salt into the atmosphere. There's one uh, effort to, to do it. Uh, Professor Salter was the first one to be working on his version of a nozzle. The, the challenge is you have to get these spray uh, it to be very, very tiny nanoparticles. They have to be about one thousandth the width of a human hair, and they haven't quite got there yet. So, in fact, they are concerned that it may take another 10, 15 years before they have the whole technology down pat, which is, from my point of view, too late because who knows what's going to happen from explosions in the Arctic Ocean before then uh, with their 50 billion tons of carbon. Anyway, um, that's our problem, the challenge of time. Okay, thank you for this one. Now I'm going to go on to number 15 uh, photo, please, Sean. And that's my last photo. It's a picture of uh, Renaud de Richter, a French scientist who has done work on iron salt aerosols. And here I'm a little bit in over my head. I don't understand the the chemistry involved, but it, it seems that let, uh, he's found out that methane, well, you know, methane is being oxidized all the time. There's much less methane in the atmosphere than there is CO2, but of course it's uh, like a hundred times or more, uh, more powerful as a greenhouse gas in warming the planet. And so a little bit of it is, is as bad or worse than CO2. Um, and, but it doesn't last as long either. The CO2 stays in the atmosphere a thousand years more, but the methane is already oxidized by oxygen in the atmosphere within 10 or 12 years. And so uh, the question is, could you knock the methane out of the atmosphere quicker, get rid of it faster so that it would have less warming effect? Well, yes, uh, director claims that you can. And, um, now, what you do, though, is you, if, when you oxidize methane, it just really turns it into CO2, which you think, well, why would you bother to do that? Uh, because CO2 is also bad. But no, it's not nearly as bad. We, we don't want CO2, but we'd sure as hell rather have CO2 than methane. 
So that's the name of the game is to try to get rid of your methane by oxidizing it in the most efficient way. Now, what you do is you bring iron into contact with sea salt, salt, of course, being in ACL um, and sodium chloride, and you generate chlorine atoms. And it's the chlorine that oxidize the methane. So nature disposes of, of methane all the time. It's, it's always done that since the beginning of the planet, I guess. So sodium chloride, well, here is where I will tell the chemists who understand this, because I, I'm not sure I do, but here's what it says. Sodium chloride from natural sea salt spray naturally generates hydrogen chloride, that's hydrochloric acid. Uh, every time it then encounters something that's acid, okay? So uh, hydrogen chloride reacts with soluble iron hydroxides to form iron salt aerosol, which is iron chloride, FeCl3. And under sunlight, the iron chloride generates chlorine atoms, which met, uh, oxidize, oxidize methane. And there you go. Voila. That's how it happens to a chemist. And I hope some of you chemists understand that. These, by the way, a, a, what they want to do is spray or disseminate a little tiny nanoparticles of, of iron into the atmosphere, either from uh, towers in the ocean, you know, islands or something, or balloons or something of that kind. Not sure how they're going to do it. But in fact, they are still thinking it through. They don't have a pilot project underway yet, but there is a company that is uh, working on this. And I did the interviews with them and with uh, Richter. Uh, but there's even a way to suppress the methane that's being emitted from wetlands. One of the main sources of uh, methane in the current uh, situation uh, is uh, rice paddies because you have to flood rice paddies. And um, there are microbes that uh, um, oxidize the methane. They uh, eat the methane, you might say. They're little enzymes. And they depend on iron to do it. So if you put more iron out for them, you increase the supply that they need to, um, to uh, do away with the methane coming out of the wetland soils and sediments and places like the rice paddy. And, and this will help to minimize the methane emissions. So there you are. I've given you five different things to think about. Uh, I can't, uh, I mean, nobody can promise you that these are going to be the silver bullet, but I think all of them are sort of silver buckshot because uh, it, we need uh, to try all of them. But you can pick if you uh, are somebody who likes to focus on one thing and, and know a little, quite a bit about one technique. I suggest that you pick one of these and focus on studying it and then try to lobby the politicians and the people who supply the money and supply the permission to do these interventions because it's going to take coordination of uh, social institutions globally to get the authority uh, from the owners of land or forests and the cooperation of, of logging companies and all of these other institutions that are have something to say about what we do with our land and our air. And they all need to cooperate and we need to decide which we think are the most promising solutions for these um, global warming uh, threats and uh, which we can, um, uh, should in a, put our money on investing, our bets on. And these five are my choices. So you make your own choices and uh, join me in trying to fight the struggle to get this uh, effort underway. That's my talk. Through. Thank you so much, uh, Meta. We'll now open the floor for comments and questions. Clement, do you have a question? Yes, I do. Um, Meta, I think your five points are in the right order, but the last two points have been extensively discussed in the world climate literature and are really last ditch 
things. Uh, for instance, changing the climate in the Arctic, while it may be very desirable, changes the jet stream. And if you change the jet stream and cause a drought in Kansas, let's say, you're liable to have repercussions. Um, shooting iron into the ocean has been discussed for 20 years. It promotes algal blooms because iron is limiting in the ocean, but algal blooms aren't necessarily a good thing. So the last two alternatives should be viewed with a great deal of caution. I don't disagree, but um, I have, I think um, I've had about four different, um, maybe more talk shows with um, Paul Beckwith and, um, and Peter Wadhams. Peter Wadhams is the leading expert on the Arctic sea ice. And uh, I would say the, the threat, the fear of uh, the emission of methane from the Arctic, especially the Leptev Sea section of the Arctic. You know, what happens is there is uh, a large, there are large deposits of methane at the bottom of, these o of the ocean. They're held down by a layer of permafrost actually in the ocean. Apparently it slid off or something. I don't know how I got there, but at any rate, the, there's a lid holding the, uh, the uh, that methane down. And nowadays that permafrost at the bottom of the ocean has perforated their holes. And where there are holes, the gas is coming up. And you can see, uh, I, was, I saw one uh, video, which I was looking for last night and couldn't find. I wanted to show you of a ship going through the Arctic Ocean and there were plumes of white, um, it looked like a plane going through clouds. Uh, it was completely white and every a, a little bit ahead of you, you could see these things, plumes coming up of plumes of white cloud. And this was all caused by the uh, emission of, of methane. Uh, so this is really lethal. This, the heating effects are, are really terrible. And it, if in the bottom of the Arctic Ocean, in the deep areas, it's not a problem because the bubbles will be uh, absorbed by the water before it can reach the surface. But around Siberia, there are many, many hundreds of miles, thousands of miles where the Siberian landmass goes, tapers off. So you have a shelf it's only 30 feet deep some places uh, uh, for long distances along the coast. And, and the, when the methane comes up from this shallow, in the shallow water, it doesn't get absorbed by the water and it makes it to the, to the surface. And you see these clouds of, of methane, which we know right now is a stupendous amount coming up. And as it warms more and more, both on land and under the water, the the um, perforations of the of the um, uh, of the permafrost will enable gusts of more and more uh, emissions to to uh, to take place. Well, you got your choice. I mean, let's assume. I uh, l let me accept your analysis that this might cause. Uh, you know, the jet stream, which, by the way, is doing really weird things. You know what the jet stream is doing is these vortexes that you hear about. Uh, you, the, you couldn't, you know, let's assume that that there are, you know, in, environmental effects that might disturb farmers in Kansas. If you have a choice between that and and the, you know, catastrophic emission of methane that would... Uh, raise the planet by three degrees Celsius, which are you going to pick? I mean, I, I don't know what's real, but I, I and, and it's all guesswork, but I know what I'd pick. We have a question from Peter uh, Wadhams. Yeah, hi. Uh, I met her. Yes, sorry. I, I got hi. the timing wrong, so I missed, I missed half of your wonderful presentation. Um, but uh, I got a couple of comments uh, based on uh, the, third, the first questions you had, had there. And one of them is uh, that the, the questioners um, might have been confusing the uh, 
amount of iron that goes into the ocean with the the uh, Russ George's method, which is seeding the ocean with iron mm. in order to make it more productive. And then the iron salt aerosol method involves only a my doesn't involve iron really going to the ocean at all, except a minute amount of of a, an aerosol of it, which is what then reacts um, with with the with the uh, hydrogen chloride. So. Um, uh, so I think we can we can we 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 mustn't confuse iron salt aerosol with iron seeding. They're they're two different things. One needs tons and tons, and the other needs tiny amount. Um, but in regard to um, saving or refreezing the Arctic, um, I, I've seen and we've all seen lots of wonder, wondrous plans for doing this, but. I mean, the important thing, as 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 um, Meta, as you've said, it's it's not so much let's refreeze the Arctic Ocean and um, bring back the sea ice, although that would be nice, but it's more let's cool the water in the Arctic Ocean to the point that the um, the methane stops, or rather the the uh, the layer of permafrost on the seabed stops thawing out. And, and therefore um, continues to act as a barrier to to methane coming out as a gas. Uh, we, so we want to to cool the Arctic. Um, we we don't. Well, I, I doubt whether we can refreeze it, but um, cooling it will be very important. And the threat from methane coming out in one great big burp is a really serious one. It's. You know it's serious because IPCC doesn't take it seriously, which and most of the things that are really serious they ignore. And um, this is really serious, and it's a very serious threat because if the methane that's in the sediments comes out of the the sediments into the ocean and then out into the atmosphere, it can cause a, a sudden increase in global temperatures. And uh, we did a model. Uh, which said you could get 0.6 of a degree in one go, which is pretty frightening. But since then, I've been even more frightened because uh, an, another, a newer, a newer modeler who uses better methods has decided that using the same amount of of methane, you're going to get 1.2 degrees of warming, which is mm. twice as much. Um, so we should be even more worried. You, I, I'm glad you're here, Peter, and uh, everybody, I should have, uh, let's introduce Peter Wadhams because Peter is the leading authority of the world on Arctic sea ice, and he's somebody I've spent some time interviewing uh, in, in these talk shows. So any questions should be deferred to Peter, and I, I hope, Peter, that what you've heard me say, that I haven't said anything misleading. If I have, that's incorrect, would you correct me? No, I agree with everything you said, and I just okay. saw this the first bit. <laughs> Good, and also anybody asking questions should uh, Peter should answer them, they, not I. And also, I noticed that uh, Oswald Peterson has joined us. Uh, Oswald is the um, business end of the project that will be oxidizing methane by using iron aerosols. So the question that was posed to there any questions about the iron salt method, uh, I, would, I would refer you to and ask Peter to comment on them. Uh, I think you've, you've arrived too late to hear uh, what I said. So if, if I made a mistake, you won't know what to correct uh, right now. But uh, Oswald, uh, maybe you can indeed update us a little bit about your current plans, because I'm not sure. I, I told people that you could disperse this iron, these iron particles over the oceans by a balloon or plane or a tower or something. But I think you said that last time I talked to you, you weren't planning to spray them. Uh, could we have uh, an explanation of what you are planning to do? Yeah, thanks a lot. And sorry for being late. I, I basically misunderstood the hours uh, in Switzerland against the Eastern time. But um, thanks for the invitation and, and having me on. Um, I'm, I just posted in the chat the 
the um, website of our company. So I'm not going to go through all that because that would take hours. But um, no, I think uh, Oswald, I, will, I think you should because people okay. watching that will not have access to the chat. So you need to say it verbally. Uh, oh, okay. Uh, so people don't have access to the chat. Okay. Um, well, when this is published, you know, they'll watch the video, but not the chat. I see. Okay. Yes. So the website is um, www.amr.earth. That's our website. And AMR stands for Atmospheric Methane Removal, AMR. And that's what we do all well. That's what we plan to, plan to do. And um, atmospheric methane removal is a method that would engage ISO, that's iron salt aerosol, and, and, and release that into the atmosphere or into the troposphere, to be more exact, at 400 meters height above the subtropic oceans. And there would be some 20 to 30 um, platforms out in the ocean, which would be old, old oil platforms, because we assume that oil will not be um, really um, pumped up anymore, but uh, the oil platforms will be left over and then we can use them for that purpose. We will put a higher tower on them so, so we can get up to that higher height because we need the aerosol to stay airborne as long as possible. The aerosol will is a photocalytic uh, or causes a photocalytic process that oxidizes methane into CO2. This is what happens to methane anyway. So we are not introducing a new process. That's a process that happens anyway. All methane actually turns into CO2 by nature. So we're not, the, the natural process is only enhanced. It's not a new process. That's very important to counter arguments that this is unnatural. It's not, it's actually very natural to do, to do this. Okay, I will not bore you any longer. Um, hopefully you can find my website. And just to answer the question of meta, I said that the dispersion, which we plan to do by big sprayers, cannot be done by sprayers because sprayers cannot create particles that are so small that they don't sink. Now, small in this case means under 100 nanometers, which is... Uh, a nanometer is one thousandth of a micrometer, which is one thousandth of a millimeter. So it's really, really, really small. And um, the size we require is so small, so the particles stay airborne as long as possible. You know that maybe from COVID research now, everybody knows about uh, aerosols nowadays because we had this COVID discussion and they stay, they stay up. They do not sink if they are as light as the air, as the surrounding air. And that is only true for very small ones. And spraying can produce micrometer size, but we need to go one step further, one order of magnitude further down to 100 nanometers or even less. And that we can only do by that new process which we are developing right now. Thank you, Oswald. I think there might be a question from Abraham Joseph. Um, I'm Abraham Joseph. I'm a uh, economist. Um, and um, of course my area is social economic development. Uh, thank you, um, Madam Spencer for an excellent, brilliant presentation. Um, that was very useful to me. Um, you, um, uh, you did mention, um, in your presentation that there is still room for 1.2 trillion trees, another 1.2 trillion trees. You know, and as you are also aware that, you know, uh, much of the land is lost by increasing de deserts, uh, particularly in the Southern hemisphere. <laughs> now, um, there is a role for the local communities, um, you know, to help in planting trees. So my question to you is, you know, um, how is the work going on relating to mobilizing the local communities um, in various countries? Thank you. It's an excellent question. And, I, and uh, as far as I know, the only work that is being done has been 
proposed by local polities. Canada, for example, says, well, we're, they said a few years ago, I haven't heard anything new about it, that Canada will plant two billion trees. Well, it, one trillion is a hundred, no, is a thousand billion. So we've got 190 countries in the world about, and if each of them planted two billion trees, we would uh, maybe make a dimple in the whole uh, project. Not only that, but the, the truth is, if you don't know what you're doing, you plant a trillion trees and three quarters of them are going to die. So unless you're doing it right, uh, you might as well stay home. It's not going to work. So it's very important to do it right. There have been proposals for mass planting by things like drones. And I cannot find definitive answer as to what the mortality rate of trees planted by drones is. They, the companies that are doing it do not want that to be known, apparently, because I can't get the data. And uh, I am not too optimistic that they are succeeding because if you just, what they do is they shoot um, sort of like a plastic pellet, which is filled with a gelatin a nu of nutrients and a seed in inside, and they shoot them into the ground, and uh, you know that, and then they they go on, and you, they try to not hit rocks. They sort of have some capacity to pick where they're going to shoot them. But once they're in the ground, that's it, you know, that you're really not going to get any care for those trees. So I'm not too optimistic. I do think that mangrove forests that have been planted by, by drones have more promise of succeeding. And I don't know why I think that, but I believe I, there's some evidence to that effect. But otherwise, I think uh, India has uh, been planting on a large scale, and I believe um, a number of other countries. And of course, China, with their... Uh, Re reclaiming the desert ha had done a, a stupendous job of, but it's more than just planting trees. I see that Peter Wadhams has put his hand up. So Peter, you know much more about this than I do, please. Uh, no, 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 sorry, I, I'd already asked my question. I, I just can't, can't find a way to take the hand oh. down. <laughs> <laughs> okay, all right. But it, anybody who knows, more about it. There are uh, individuals that are organizing things, and there's something called the Trillion Tree Campaign, organized by a young boy named Felix, who was about 10 years old when he got started, having a grade school kids plant trees. I saw a video he made recently, and they have operations going on all around the world where they have children planting trees. It's wonderful. And I think they actually are very, he claims that their mortality rate for trees is, is uh, very, very low. So the, these children are taught not only how to plant the trees, but which trees to plant and how to take care of them. And they go back and look after them. So if they do that, then, you know, marvelous. And, and quite large tracts of trees are available. You can look it up and, and, and um, donate money to them uh, to buy uh, trees for them to plant. Uh, so I, I can't answer your question very well, but yes, local um, individual uh, humanitarian projects. Of course, uh, uh, Wangami Masai, what, uh, I can't remember her name, but the one, woman who got the Nobel Prize, Peace Prize, is a number of years ago, she's dead, but she was planting uh, trees in Africa and there's still a plan to uh, plant a green belt of trees all the way across the middle of Africa with the idea of stopping the progression of desertification. It has not been a roaring success yet, but, you know, they're still working on it and bless their hearts. Yeah, we're um, really out of time, but I think we've got uh, one more question left. And I think, Clement, you've got your hand up again. Is that correct? Yep. Um, I'll just add to Meta's comments about um, the success of training local people. I've monitored a project run by indigenous people in central Mexico, and they live and farm in the areas where the monarchs overwinter. You know that the monarchs are threatened by unregulated logging on those slopes. This project teaches the local people to grow their own tree seedlings 
and to plant them and take care of them. There are government run planting, planting projects which have a 10 to 15% survival rate. The indigenous people's efforts have about an 80% survival rate. Um, I'll give uh, you one last opportunity to raise any questions or make any comments before we sign off. Somebody should take your take a, a, a opportunity to ask Peter Wadhamson uh, whatever questions you want about the Arctic because he's the real expert here. I'm I'm the uh, just a journalist, so to speak. And if, if you got Peter Wadhams here, use him quickly. <laughs> <laughs> let me let me comment on something first, which is refreezing the Arctic. You have to be very very careful if you're thinking about ways to do it and um, there's a, a big popular effort being made now of um, actually piling ice on top of other ice um, pumping pumping water over ice to have it freeze and I'm, I'm really kind of skeptical about that because if you look at the energies in, and the heat involved um, I, I don't think it's going to work so uh, but there are, there are other ways, and the big one of the best ways is marine cloud brightening, because um, uh, when when the method is modelled, and you look at um, uh, where you where you need to inject the the uh, uh, the water droplets, uh, you can you can aim your your a fleet of your drone ships such that you achieve maximum positive uh, effort. Uh, in in a region like the Ice Age region, and and you can get, according to models anyway, significant improvements in the area of sea ice. So that which is which is what you're trying to do. So um, it 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 does work, or at least in according to models it works. But nobody has yet done it, mainly because nobody has funded the sort of fleets of of drone ships that. Uh, Stephen Salter needs, and uh, even even at COP26, when since he's Scottish, he was there as the sort of great great leading figure in COP26. But that still didn't induce the British government to give him any money. So it's a very annoying for him and for the world, I think. I think there's a question from Odile. Oh, dear, James, there are a couple of hands up still. Do we have any time left? It was a question about, uh, I heard from Bruce Gagnon that a fight against weapon in space, especially nuclear weapon in space. And he told us that the Rand Corporation had put a plan to destabilize Russia in order to mine the Arctic and exploit it. I'm not sure exactly from what. I have not read the report from the Rand Corporation, but he gave us a link. And I will eventually read that report. But I was wondering whether is that really the reason why the Ukraine, and they want to destabilize Russia so they can mine the Arctic? That was my question. I can't answer that. I, I, I challenge anybody to give a good answer to that. <laughs> it's a good, good question, Odile, but I, we're into guesswork here. Okay, so this will be the, 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 the yeah. last question, I'm afraid, and it's from Oswald. Oh, thank you. Thank you, James. I just wanted to say that um, I actually I don't have a question for Peter, but I do have his book. And I just want to put it in here. <laughs> <That's> <laughs> Thank that you. If you have questions about the Arctic, read this book. <laughs> read it. And it's I published by this one too. <laughs> it's very, very you know, We're talking about this methane thing. That the last final issue of Peace Magazine's in print it has a picture in. This is set in Alaska on a lake. And the woman has poked a hole in the lake and is burning the methane. So, you know, it's everywhere, fellas. <laughs> and, I, 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 you know, Peter and I are 
<laughs> trying to work on methane. I don't know what everybody else is working on, but I believe in trying to solve the methane problem first off. So thank you, Oswald, for pointing out his book. Great. <laughs> so uh, it leads me now to thank um, Meta Spencer for her excellent presentation here today. Thank you so much for accepting our invitation to come to our McLaughlin College Lunchtime Talks. I'd like to thank everyone for being here, especially uh, uh, our, our eminent guests. And uh, uh, thank everyone else for joining us here today. I want to remind everyone that uh, our Social Justice Week at McLaughlin College starts next week. And uh, it is part of our Black History Month uh, events that will take place as well. So please visit our website for the uh, latest upcoming events and we hope to see you there. So thank you everyone for joining us and uh, we hope to see you again soon.